Hi, I'd like to talk to you about respiratory physiology in pregnancy. One thing to remember about pregnancy is that this overall demands increased metabolism. The mother has to provide increased metabolism support for the metabolism of the growing fetus. There are some key physiologic changes to keep in mind. There are mechanical effects from the growing size of the uterus. Then there's increased ventilatory requirements and increased circulatory requirements. There are changes in the chest wall of the mother that accommodate uh, changes in the enlarging uterus. This includes an elevation of the diaphragm by about four centimeters over the course of pregnancy and an increase in the subcostal angle as demonstrated in this figure. Because of these changes to accommodate the enlarging uterus, the actual total lung capacity is usually not significantly changed. What you see is that spirometry in pregnancy generally res remains normal. Total lung capacity may decrease minimally, but the major change that you do see is a decrease in the functional residual capacity. This can be by up to 30%. This is caused by a symmetric decrease, usually, in expiratory reserve volume and residual volume. This is in contrast to a situation like obesity, where there may be a significant decrease in FRC, primarily driven by a reduction in expiratory reserve volume. This graph shows those changes more visually. On the left side is the non-pregnant state, and on the right is the pregnant state. You can see total lung capacity is very slightly lower, but the big change is to be noted at the level of the FRC. You can see the FRC in the pregnant state is much less than that in the non-pregnant state, and expiratory reserve volume and residual volume have reduced rather symmetrically. Gas exchange in pregnancy doesn't significantly change. Diffusing capacity as measured by DLCO maneuvers is usually about the same. What you do see in pregnancy is a substantial increase in the minute ventilation. This supports the increased metabolism, increased basal metabolic rate of the mother, and is primarily driven by an increase in tidal volume. You can see tidal volume may increase by as much as 50%, but the respiratory rate is minimally changed. This is why often looking at a pregnant woman, you wouldn't think that she is hyperventilating or that her minute ventilation is all that increased. Simply the tidal volume is deeper. This change occurs actually rather early in pregnancy in the first trimester, and then further increases uh, are much smaller in magnitude, and is probably mediated by increased serum progesterone levels. In doing this, you see that the minute ventilation increases by up to 50%. This supports the increased oxygen consumption and carbon dioxide production that accompanies the increased basal metabolic rate. But the minute ventilation increases to a greater degree than is just required for metabolism. Again, this is probably a direct effect of progesterone. Because of this, normal arterial blood gas values are not normal to find in pregnancy. This so-called excess minute ventilation results in a chronic respiratory alkalosis. So if you look at these values of the arterial blood gas in the pregnant state and compare those to the normal values in the non-pregnant state, you'll see the pH is a little bit higher. You'll see the serum, I'm sorry, the PCO2 is a little bit lower, consistent with a respiratory alkalosis. Over time, there is compensation that does occur in the body, and the serum bicarbonate will decrease accordingly as a compensatory metabolic acidosis. This is particularly important that you know these values when you're assessing pregnant patients who may have asthma and may be suffering from asthma exacerbation. You would not want to ignore or miss the fact that a quote unquote normal PCO2 in a pregnant asthmatic uh, may in fact be a sign of respiratory acidosis and decompensation. So beware the normal ABG in the pregnant asthmatic. Now this slide uh, is one that it might be worth you pausing on for a bit just to read the text here and to see some of the possible causes of acute respiratory failure in pregnancy. There are many potential causes of this. Often they are evaluated the same that you would evaluate the non-pregnant patient. We'll cover a couple of these just to point out some particular features, 
but I'd encourage you if you have other uh, desire to read more to check the following reference from where this table is taken uh, which is a great overview of uh, critical care of the pregnant patient. Let's talk specifically about amniotic fluid embolism as a cause of respiratory failure in pregnancy. This occurs, as you know, because of the exposure of fetal tissue into the maternal circulation. This causes inflammation in a dramatic fashion. This can lead to clinical findings of DIC and bleeding, ARDS, respiratory failure, and neurologic injury. In fact, you'll want to look for all three of these possibilities when considering amniotic fluid embolism on your differential diagnosis. Pregnancy causes a number of circulatory changes as well. Uh, this is again because of the increased metabolic demand. And what we see is an increased cardiac output and a decrease in the systemic and pulmonary vascular resistance. This could be conceptualized as sort of a low-grade sepsis picture. Look here. You see that the cardiac output is elevated with both increases in heart rate and stroke volume. And here you'll see the systemic vascular resistance has decreased as well as the pulmonary vascular resistance. This also fits the pattern for a patient in shock of what we might call distributive shock. And so if you want to consider the pregnant state as sort of a low-grade distributive shock state, this may help you understand why patients who are pregnant may have a below normal physiologic reserve when they're faced with a critical illness. There are a number of references that can help uh, and if you are encountering the care of a patient uh, with critical illness who is pregnant, uh, I'd encourage you to check these out. Uh, this presentation is no substitute for the medical advice that you could obtain from your physician and so I encourage you to use these resources as needed. For the most part, however, our conventional critical care therapies are utilized whether patients are pregnant or not. We have to take particular care for drug safety and also consider some of the hemodynamic effects that can be caused by the gravid uterus. The last cause of acute respiratory failure in pregnancy I wanted to highlight was tocolytic induced pulmonary edema, a well recognized complication of tocolytic therapy uh, terbutaline, which is often used to inhibit preterm labor. In the right clinical setting, with a patient who has received terbutaline either currently or within the past 24 hours, the acute onset of infiltrates and hypoxemia should lead you to make this diagnosis. The treatment is supportive, including discontinuing terbutaline, and with this type of care is rarely fatal to mother or baby. A few drugs you should remember by rote memory and all others in pregnancy, it's reasonable to look up uh, in your drug reference for the safety and use in pregnancy. These are the big ones. Of course, you would always avoid warfarin, ACE inhibitors, nonsteroidal anti-inflammatory medications, and phenytoin because of risks to the fetus. There is also consideration to avoid quinolone antibiotics, tetracyclines, and there is an indication to avoid Versed. However, these might be utilized if it's felt that the benefit of these medications for the mother and baby outweigh the potential risks. So what are the key points to remember when you think about a pregnant patient with a critical illness? Remember that the normal blood gas values are different in pregnancy. Normal PCO2 is around 30 instead of 40. Normal PO2 is around 100 or even a little bit higher. However, the oxygen reserves for the patient are lower. This is partly because of the reduction in functional residual capacity and the higher basal metabolic rate consuming oxygen at a more rapid rate. For this reason, pregnant patients, when undergoing endotracheal intubation, may have a shorter time until desaturation occurs, even with adequate preoxygenation. This should be taken into account, and in general, a very experienced provider should perform intubations. Uh, in patients who are pregnant. The growing uterus can also impede venous return mechanically. In patients who are in shock or who need significant volume resuscitation, you may consider side positioning of the patient as a way to relieve pressure on the inferior vena cava or the abdominal venous return 
uh, to allow better perfusion and better filling of the heart. So in summary, in pregnancy we can think about the fact that metabolism for the mother increases uh, as the fetus grows. We tend to see normal spirometry but a significant reduction in functional residual capacity. This reduction in functional residual capacity leads to lower oxygen reserves and combined with a higher basal metabolic rate can reduce the time that you have for oxygenation during an endotracheal innovation. There's an increased minute ventilation primarily driven by an increase in tidal volume. This is over and above what is required just for increased metabolism because it's probably stimulated by progesterone and so you see a chronic respiratory alkalosis in pregnancy. Finally, the hemodynamics of normal pregnancy include an increased cardiac output and a decreased vascular resistance. This can be thought of as a situation like low-grade sepsis or low-grade distributive shock and can be one reason why critically ill pregnant patients may have lower reserve than expected. I hope you've enjoyed this brief overview and encourage you to review the other included references uh, for more reading uh, as you take care of our patients. Thank you for your attention.